So back with Atlanta Quest, you guys, and I hate to say it like this, you always seem to be hanging around in the same position at the at the end at finals. What do you think it's going to take for Quest to break through into the top 10 and higher? Consistently, comfortably. Yes. Yeah, no, that's something we ask ourselves too. Uh, we've actually, we've the last two years have been our second and third most successful years ever. We came in 12th, right? Prior to that, our best finish was eighth, our first year. So we went eighth our first year. And I didn't know that you'd already been in the top 10. Yeah, no, all good. Yeah, so, well, it's easy to forget when it was 12 years ago, right? So our first year, we were in eighth. Uh, and then we just bounced literally 13, 15, 13, 15, 13 for like seven years. So yeah, we were, we were, we were stuck. Uh, I thought 2020, everyone, everyone says this, but we really mean it. Everyone's, we were going to be awesome in 2020. Uh, we were awesome. I thought we were probably going to come in seventh to 10th in, in 2020. Uh, but then obviously COVID happened and missed prelims. And then we had 12th, two years in a row, but to your point, yeah, we are very much entrenched in that, like you know, normally safely in finals, right? You can kind of pencil us in somewhere in the bottom third, right? Uh, what does it take to get us past that? I think I think it takes, this is something we've discussed, right? Going back to the beginning is our identity is drumming, drumming, right? Like, do we need to do something so different that the that the judges say, wow, Look at you guys. This is a new brand of Atlanta Quest, right? Are the judges just preconceived in their opinion of us because we've done it for so long, right? Uh, the answer, in our opinion, was no, we don't need to go that far. But if you're asking me, like, what do we absolutely need to do better? We need to do, we need to have bigger, more memorable moments, right? Like when you watch a show, generally you take away three or four huge things if, if it's wildly successful. Um some of that used to be back in the day, you'd leave the the arena humming the melody, right? But it's just not written that way. Shows aren't written to be remembered musically as much, right? Shows and the way that the activity is judged is what is the biggest, most produced moment you can have from an entire package standpoint that we can remember? And how many of those can you give me and how varied can they be, right? So from a very general viewpoint, Last year's show, we played well, we went fast, and we can probably explain the nuance that should have been there or was there to us. But if you're just a passenger, you're a judge, you saw fast, clean, fast, clean, and then it was slightly slower, and it rained, and we were, you know, maybe a slightly slower clean, and then it was fast, clean again, right? Uh, you know, I, th I think our most memorable moment was the first thing we did which was an idea Alan Sears had forever. He's like, I just want to start the show with the snares. Like no sound patch, no moody, you know, rumble, no pit intro, snare drum. And just let it, and let it feel like a cold attack. Like how did they even know to come in together, you know? Correct, exactly. And we, we actually rehearsed that a couple different, I mean, a lot in terms of how do we exactly start like that how do we get the music to go like the house music to go down right before we do it? And we messed it up a lot. Luckily we got it, but that was our most memorable thing for the entire show. I think was the first thing we did. How do we get that again, 45 seconds later, again, a minute later, and it's better each time. So generally what we need is more huge, memorable programmatic moments that are both visually and musically and mainly visually uh, compelling. And how do we do that five times in a show? Um, so the, the way we do it is, is by designing a different way, is by bringing in people. We know what we're good at. We know what we're good at. Our, our design team is very good at what they do. Uh, we just have gaps, right? So we brought in a couple of new folks. Uh, we brought a guy from um, uh, Cirque du Soleil. Cirque, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, a guy named Kit Chatham who's friends with Alan. Uh, he's known him for years. I think Alan taught Kit. Kit taught Alan. I don't know. Somehow they know each other. Um, and Kit actually helped at Terminus Atlanta Percussion in 2011. He did a little body stuff for us. Uh, but no, he's designed a bunch of Cirque shows, right? Um, and then we got a guy from Crown, Tarpon Springs, um, Paramount, 
a guy named Tyler Edrington who's you know going to help with our programmatic design, our big moments, right? So again, we know what we're good at and we know where we need help. Uh, so the the plan was to bring in two new folks to really position us where we want to be, which in my opinion is the top ten, ideally a single digit, right? Like I can't control if we're in seventh or tenth or whatever, but we need to do something different. We can't just keep doing the same show every year. Uh, you know, the same structure, the same flow. Um, we got to do something different. So again, it's not going to be Broken City, right? We're not going to suddenly become the most deep, you know, esoteric group out there that's going to kill you emotionally and intellectually. Like, but hopefully we get a, a few spatterings of that, right? There's some moments in there where if you want the depth, you're going to get it, right? And there's going to be hopefully moments where, You're going to be wowed by the entire programmatic development um, from visual to music to everything. So that's what we need. I think we need to move. We need to use props a little bit better. That's something we're behind is multi-dimensional props, right? If you look at everyone, with the exception of maybe one or two people, there's a prop that can go this way and that way and it can roll and it can light up. You know, our prop was a giant TV in the back, which was cool. But after two minutes, is it moving the needle Uh, probably not, right? So how do we get better props that can be more impactful? So, you know, there was like a, we 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 chat after the season, you know, we say, okay, what'd we do well? What'd we do poorly? We watch every finalist. We say, okay, what do we do better than these guys? Where are we lagging behind? And, you know, we probably found five or six things where we said, we need these things to be more competitively successful. Um, and I, again, I'm not involved in design. I just kind of advise, right? I'm the consultant almost. Uh, cause if I designed the show, we'd be in last place and, and open, right? <laughs> you know, I'm the least creative guy in the world. Uh, but what I'm good at is, is critiquing it, um, and saying, Hey, I think this is good, but I don't think this is going to work. Can you guys start thinking of something better? Uh, and then implementing it. So hopefully we made the changes that we need to, to, uh, get to where we want to be George, which is, you know, top 10. You know what, you know, what's interesting though, something that I'll point out and I'm probably, cause this is what I do making a connection, um, trying a little bit too hard to make a connection, but that opening snare moment, um, is a little bit of like a manifestation of exactly what you described as being like your vibe, right? Which is hanging out loose. And then all of a sudden flip the switch and we're on, right? Like, and it's it almost like it appears out of nowhere, right? Um, I mean that go ahead. Go no, ahead. You, you, you. Well, I was just gonna say, like, whether or not you are you were you actually designed that moment or had any hand in that, somehow there's a consistency, right? Of like maybe somebody who didn't, you know, who doesn't know, they'd be like, that reminds me of TJ, <laughs> that opening moment, you know, like like who you are as a person. Yeah, no, I'll take it. I'll take it. I don't think that was the plan. Uh, but but I'll I'll take it. Yeah. Alan just had the idea of If I was in a supercar and I was just going, if if I'm at a red light and I'm ready to take off, pedal to the metal, what would that sound like? Uh, and that's kind of what he went for, and and I think it worked. But no, I think that I think that's a fair connection, which is okay. We're setting up, we're chilling, we're hanging out. Boom, we're in there. So something else I wanted to um, sort of point out. Um, And then I just lost it. Our brains. While, while you're thinking of of what you what you just lost, I want to say this. Go ahead. The most memorable, one of the most memorable moments of, for me on last year's show was the I wear my sunglasses at night. That that snare feature. Yeah. That just was like, uh, yeah. No, that one was that cool. Was sweet. Yeah. Here's what it, here's here's what it is. Um, when you look at like how does how does a group essentially rebrand? Because sometimes you need to make the judges look at you in a fresh way, right? How do you do that and still remain yourself? Not, not sort of, you know, how do you do that with integrity, right? Um, people could point at George Mason, um, whatever it was, 2019. 2019. Because they had, they had, you know, similar, they came into world class around the time that Atlanta Quest did. Um, cause they, they won open class 2012, I think it was, um, and sort of, you know, very similar thing where it's like they burst onto the scene, uh, those first couple of years, actually Mike Jackson, 
and Kevin Shaw, like, you know, uh, had a lot to do with designing those shows. Um, but then similar, similar thing, right. Where, where are we, where are we sort of settling in and getting comfortable? And then all of a sudden in 2019, that was the, um, you know, the, the Joseph pink. Noah inspired show. Yeah. Yeah. What were you going to say, TJ? I said the pink one, right? The pink and green one. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. That was the, a show. The, the rapper. That was a show that was so, that felt so fresh, so sort of outside the sandbox that we've all seen, feel like we've been playing in. But it was when you asked them, right? And, and I did, because I was like, where did this come from? You know, like, um, they were like, that's Dan. That's Dan Shack just being himself. And obviously, uh, adding in that layer of Joseph Noah on the floor, like being that member that had been there for a little while. Um, this is also him very authentically. And this is us unapologetically being ourselves in a very fearless and bold way. Um, there, I'm, my guess is it would be something like that where there is, there is something that speaks to who Atlanta Quest is fundamentally but feels fearless and bold and fresh. That's that's the hope that you watch it and you're like, is this Atlanta Quest? This, I think this is, but it's badass in a different way, right? Like we don't want you to think we're someone else, but we want it to feel like a different version of, of who we are, right? And um, I guess we'll find out in a few months if uh, if we've achieved it. But yeah, I think that's that's the goal, George. Is kind of what you're describing. Um, I wanted to ask you, since you've been on staff at Quest for so long, right? Um, we don't have to go through all of it because you know we're uh, we're we're you know coming towards the end of this. But I did want to ask you um, two things during that time period. Can you think of any moments, any seasons, or or moments um, that were particularly particularly um, impactful for you in your evolution, right? As, um, as going from, I'm sure you started off as like a tech and then, and then just, uh, getting more and more responsibility, any particular years that were really, especially meaningful to you in terms of taking steps forward, but then also for the group, right? Um, cause the group has gone through an evolution over that time period. Anything you want to, any, any, any particular seasons you want to talk about? Yeah, I think I think 2017 was a big one for me personally, because you're right. I started as a tech in 14 and 15, uh, snare tech B in 14, right? I was just like the fill-in guy. Uh, 15, I became more of like the lead snare tech guy. And then 16, it, it was crazy. When, when we started in Atlanta Quest, like the, the teaching infrastructure was like five dudes. It was like Alan, who's a fa who founded it, Larry, who helped found it. Um, he's not there anymore. He has two kids actually in Q2, which is, his, which is awesome. Uh, Zach Marshall and maybe like t three people, right? The whole staff was like seven people. And now we got like 26 or something just teaching. Um, but when I started, yeah, I was just a snare tech, but there was, there, there was like, not like a ensemble guy or a battery guy or this guy. It was just like, Alan kind of did most of the music stuff and he's a battery guy. So we kind of ran everything. Right. Um, I think Alan took a while to like, trust me to do more. Right. And in 2016, I became like the battery coordinator, um, or assistant. It was me and Anya. Anya just moved out or just aged out. We were supposed to be co co battery coordinators in 16. And prior to me being the, I guess we did have a guy. We had a guy named Mike Medeo. I completely forgot this. So Mike Medeo is an old George Mason guy. Uh, blue coat guy forever on bass drum. And he moved to Atlanta to get his MBA or a master's or something analytics or tech or technology or engineering from Georgia tech. And uh, he became the, he, he was, he was actually the battery guy for two years uh, for 14 and 15. Uh, he was like the first external guy Alan hired in a long time. So he actually did the ensemble stuff. Uh, and then he left in 16. He moved up to Philly or New York or something like that. Uh, Washington, DC. And then I, me and Anya took over in 16 and we didn't know what the hell we were doing, right? Like prior to that point, I'd never run ensemble. I'd never run any ensemble, right? Like even when I taught high schools, I was always just like the battery guy. And then there was a percussion director that did it. Um, but we realized like, 
pretty early on me and me and Anya wanted to split responsibilities, but somehow we just ended up to where like I was doing most of it. Right. Uh, and then there was a point in 16 where Alan, he's the head guy, but he's so creative and he's as the designer, when he's watching ensemble, most of what he's thinking about is design, right? Like, what can I change? What are the design problems with this? And it, he's so locked in on that. There wasn't enough like execution comments, technical comments, right? So in 16, I started to do a little bit of that just because there's there was no one else to do it because Mike Medeo left, right? Um, so in 16, I kind of halfway did it. And then in 17, it was like, okay, TJ, like you're the guy, right? Like you are ensemble dude. Right. And I had a little bit of training on it in 16, just by figuring it out. But uh, 17 was big for me because it, it taught me how to run an ensemble. It taught me how to plan. And that's that's one thing I tell the kids early on is, you know, there's probably more talented people than me. Right. There's there's smarter people than me in my position. There's smarter people than me all around me at Quest. Right. I'm not like a classically trained music guy. Right. Like music theory, this, that. I'm not great at that, right? Like what I'm great at is this activity and I am, I'm good at balance. I'm good at clarity. I'm good at front to back timing. Right. Um, but there's a lot of people with better qualifications and are smarter, but no one is going to be more planned and more diligent and more committed than me. Right. And that's what I tell the kids is you, there may be more talented kids than you in Ohio or California. Right. But, We're going to out diligent them. We're going to out passion them. We're going to out care them. That's how we're going to do this shit. Um, and that's one thing I had to learn in 17 is there's gaps in my skill set. Absolutely. Um, but how do I plan to run an ensemble correctly? And how do I plan to run a three hour block efficiently? And I wasn't great at it, but you got to figure it out. So bit by bit, I, I got better and better and better. But in 2017 was the first time where it was like, okay, TJ, like go. Uh, so that that was pretty key in my development. As we're winding, and then, oh, go ahead. No, I was about to say, and then I guess culturally, if there's one other season that sticks out, it'd be 23, which was our comeback year, right? Um, just rallying the troops, coming back from missing semis. I mean, that was brutal. I don't know if you guys watched the documentary. Uh, 100%, like, yeah, 100%, yeah, 100% yeah. we did, yeah. yeah. My, my friend Forrest Roy did an absolute amazing job capturing that, right? But um, that was such an important year for us. Because after you miss semis, you better get back or you're not getting back, right? Like you're either a finalist group or you're not. And to me, you know, if you miss if you miss finals, if you miss semis two years in a row, you're not a world class ensemble, right? Like you're not. You might have the title, but you're not. And it was very important for us to get back into it. Uh, and the grit, and that was a less experienced group than we've had a lot. Like a lot of just random Q two kids, random kids off the street. talent wise wasn't comparable but what they instilled was like a culture of fucking work ethic and passion and commitment that i think you know has set us up nicely for the future so those are the two that i'd say that would stand out 17 for me 23 for the entire group absolutely it must have been pretty rough being preliminated like that in uh yeah 22 and was was it like when that happened did you like that night vow that that's not going to happen the next year Or did you have to do a lot of reflection on, okay, what went wrong? No, I mean, I, I think two things. One, that night we sat down and when we, when we looked at the phone and we learned it, right? Like I sat the whole group down and we cried, right? And, you know, they would, kid, kids didn't come to Atlanta Quest to come in 22nd place, right? It was a shock. Uh, I think they knew there was maybe some risk of missing finals. I don't think anyone thought we were going to miss prelims. But honestly, I think it's better that we got absolutely obliterated and didn't get close. Cause I think when you get embarrassed like that, it's, you don't feel like you're just a little bit out, right? It's not like, Oh, we can make a minor tweak to improve. No, it's like, we got to do something. Yeah. Like we have to be astronomically different in how we do things. Right. And part of it was me and Zach Marshall weren't there and we didn't set people up for success who kind of succeeded us. Right. Uh, but from a design standpoint, it was just not it. Right. So it, it took a lot of humility from the staff to be like, okay, We shit the bed. We cannot do that again, right? But I sat the kids down and I said, you know, let's feel what we need to feel, right? Let's get it all out. And then I looked at them. I looked at everyone in the eye and I, I went to some people individually and I said, look, you give me one more year to fix it. Give me like, do you trust me? The guy right in front of you. 
okay, if you trust me, give me one year to get this thing back on track. And if I fail, you go wherever you want, baby. But if, if you believe in me, you give me one more year to fix it. I'm going to try my best to get all the pro I talked about this, all the processes in place for competitive success. And I was obsessed with what did we do wrong? Planning, teaching, designing, right? I said, give me a year. Let's see how it works. Uh, and luckily we had shocking retention from 22 to 23, right? Like shocking. If, if I was a talented kid in 22, knowing me, like how much I care about competitive success, if I was 20 years old, And I know I had two years left. Would I have come back? Maybe. I might have gone to Mystique or Infinity or anywhere, right? Somewhere close. Uh, but I think they they had a lot of belief in in the culture and the people. Uh, and yeah, it was it was tough. It was really tough getting preliminated, but uh, like watching kids cry. I don't like that. It's not fun, but it was good for the organization overall. So You've taught at the drum corps level the, la the last couple of years, uh, most recently at uh, the Mandarins. What does 2025 drum corps wise look like for you, or are you taking a break? Yeah, no. Uh, I I didn't know if I'd ever be a drum corps guy. I got. I remember when I was young, right after I aged out, Academy wanted me to do six weeks, uh, and I said, "Okay, how much are you paying me?" And they said twelve hundred dollars, and I said, uh, "I did the math very quickly, and I said there is no chance in hell I am working for two hundred dollars a week for twelve hours a day, right?" So at that point, you know, I got a call every now and then, but it, it's just very difficult with the desk job. Uh, and I got very lucky that Taha landed at Mandarin's, right, um, and built a built a great program. And when I showed up, I didn't think they'd be in fifth or sixth place, right? I didn't know that was the drum crew I was signing up for. I thought I was signing up for like the eleventh or twelfth or something. Uh, but I showed up, and somehow they were just kicking ass. Uh, so Mandarin's was great. It's it took a while to get used to drum corps again. The sweat, mainly the sweat, the smell. Right. Uh, I remember the first day I went there in 2023, last summer, we had a show and I taught and uh, I taught the rehearsal before and then I did the show and I, you know, we rehearsed before, then I showered and then I was ready for the show. And then I taught the show and watched the show and walked around and I, and I sweat again. And I asked the, the staff, like, hey, are we showering again before we get on the bus? And they were like, no, we're getting on the bus and just driving eight hours. I'm like, but I just sweat. I just sweat at the show and I have to sleep in my own sweat. And they said, yeah. So Micah, Micah called me a prissy indoor house cat. That's that's what he called me. Uh, but I, I, I got used to it by like day four. I was like, okay, this is awesome. Uh, so luckily yeah, I had two good, two good years at Mandarin's and they let us go, which was unfortunate. But uh, I, I landed with Boston, which is exciting. Um, so me and Colin have been talking a little bit and I'll be there this summer, uh, probably about the same amount of time I was doing at Mandarin's. I think I have, I have a max capacity of tour life before I will just, I assume die. Um, I have about two weeks in me, so I'll probably do, you know, 14, 15 days with them, which is exciting. Cause I don't know if you guys have watched the age out podcast. I have been pretty, uh, pretty forthright with my, uh enjoyment of the boston battery i think they've been the best battery section for probably four years in a row uh and i'm excited to be a part of it i think it's unique because i know you kind of talked about this rob like we're in that window right i teach quest i teach mandarins I'm, i know i'm good in the six to twelve range right um i'm very excited to see what i can bring to the second best group in the world right like uh it's a new challenge for me and When you're my age, 34, you've been teaching a while, there's not a lot of chances to do something new and something challenging. Um, and I think I'm I'm very excited to have that opportunity. So I'm pumped to be at Boston. It'll be cool. Yeah, you know, in that same spirit, because uh, because we sort of, we've talked a lot about, um, or I sort of teed it up, you know, very early on of like, I perceive you as somebody with a lot of conviction and a lot of like, uh, certainty about here's how we should do things. And, and you work really hard to uh, make sure that, that that meets your own sort of standard. Um, but you've also alluded to uh, at various points during our conversation about here's what I could do better, right? Um, and then you just alluded to uh, you're getting older, right? Doing this. Um, 
what do you hope for yourself uh, as far as like growth, getting better at things, things to achieve uh, before you're done doing this? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I only got a few years left. I think eventually me and my wife are probably getting close to having a kid. And I think that is probably going to stunt this whole weekend thing I do for six months of the year. Right. Uh, so I'm running out of time. Um, you know, for Atlanta quest, my goal there personally, like Atlanta quest is my baby, right? Like I, I loved mandarins. I'm excited to do Boston, but like at my core, what I care about most is Atlanta quest. Right. So like, what I, what I care about, what I'm, I guess, most passionate about achieving in my legacy, right? If there is a legacy, it's when I pass this thing off in the next couple of years, I want Atlanta Quest to be in the best spot from an infrastructure standpoint, from a commercial standpoint, from a retention standpoint, from a staff standpoint, that there's no dip, right? Because we failed at that in 22. Because me and Zach tried to step back after COVID, and we just absolutely bungled the transition there in terms of succession planning and, and whatnot. So when I came back, I was obsessed, as I mentioned, about getting everything in place, new website, better commercial uh, merch, better planning, better infrastructure, um, a better network of alumni, parents, right? Like every little bit of it. If there's a legacy, it's that like when I leave this thing, hopefully it just keeps running smoothly in my absence and it, it continues to take off, right? Uh, hopefully we've had enough four or five, six year vets who want to come back and teach. Uh, and I think we have some good folks that can fill the shoes eventually. But for me personally, I don't, I don't give myself a goal of like, you know, I want to win DCI or win WGI, right? Like I would love to be a, a perennial top 10 group uh, with Atlanta quest. Do I think we're going to win a title in my next couple of years? No, I don't, but I would love to. But if, if, you know, if I can put us in a spot where in five years, we're, you know, top five, top six group after I leave. And then in 10 years, we're winning titles, right? I know this thing takes time, but, you know, it's it's about what's in place. And that's important to me. So, um, yeah, I think it is, I, as you mentioned, George, I am getting older, uh, running out of years and in, in the, the Boston thing, you know, it's it's a, just such a unique opportunity to learn. And you mentioned it, you know, I, I'm my own biggest critic constantly, right? And I talk about what I mess up. I tell the staff, hey, that was a bad rehearsal and it was all my fault, right? Like uh, I, I totally take ownership when I make mistakes and I want my staff to do the same thing. And I, I want to focus on improvement and I'm excited to to improve by being around the people at Boston, right? Like they've got something good going on. Hopefully I can add, I talked to Colin about this. Hopefully I can add 2% here, 5% here. You know, what's the tiny missing thing we can do? Um, obviously I'm not going to come in and change things, but hopefully there's this little maybe gaps or little things I say slightly different that gets the point across. Uh, but mostly I'm, I'm excited to learn from them because they're wildly successful. Uh, and I, I learned a lot from Taha. I thought I was organized Taha. I mean, in terms of planning and organization, I rip his stuff off. Right. Um, I plan on ripping some stuff off from Boston. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the plan. That's the hope is uh, always trying to improve. So that's great. I'm good. I only have like one other thing to add, but it's, it's not like drumline related. We we're talking about soccer earlier. I'm not like the MLS fan, but once World Cup starts, I am like the biggest soccer fan. Are do you follow? Are you like a English Premier League guy, Bundesliga, or, or what? Do you still follow soccer? I do. I'm obsessed with uh, a group or a group, but a team called Arsenal. So we are you know, Arsenal in the English Premier League up in North London. I've been to a match up there. It was fun. Uh, yeah, I care about, there's probably like three teams I really care about in sports. It's the University of Georgia football team and Arsenal. They're like kind of tied for number one. Uh, the Falcons used to be. We lost you there for a second. When, once you said Falcons, are you there? Oh yeah. All right. No, can you hear me? Yeah. You were talking about the Falcons. We lost you there for a second. The Falcons used to be my crown jewel. I used to love, it. used to be my, uh, my number one team, but it's tough to root for the Falcons. Are you a Patriot? Are you a Patriots fan now after that Super Bowl? Yeah. Years back. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just that's that's salt in the wounds right there. Yeah. I'm I'm not even mad. I don't even hold the Patriots accountable for it. I blame one person and one person only, and his name is Kyle Shanahan. And I take so much enjoyment 
in watching the 49ers get to the playoffs and blow it every year <laughs> under his under his leadership. I I hate Kyle Shanahan so much. So, yeah, but no, I'm a big sports guy. Uh big golf guy. I golf all the time. I like basketball too. You got to come out to Southern California so we can We're going to have to play. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys you guys play? Oh, oh yeah. man. What I what I do isn't called so much playing as like just sucking. Yeah. But but that's but George could exactly. bomb it. George could bomb it out there. No, but it, what was what was what's funny is um, so many people. I feel like we don't talk about it enough because everybody feels like they struggle too much to to be able to like talk about it. Yeah. So many drummers golf. So many people like we did a thing. We filmed a thing. I don't. I don't know if you've if you've seen it yet, TJ. Where um, we got together with a couple of guys and we did a roundtable about technique and we just did like three hour discussion about like getting super granular and super philosophical about technique. Um, like Nick the Ars- one that just came out with right. Nick and Danny and them. Yeah. Nick and Danny and Connor, all three of them, like Connor came from the driving range to do, to do that thing. And Danny and Nick are budding golfers. And they were all like, I don't know if we really, go-. and even Zach Schlicker, when we had him on, yeah. he's like, I don't even know if I'm a golfer, but that's how you know you're a golfer because you have, because everybody has that same perspective of like, I kind of suck a lot, but I love it. Except for, Sco- except for Scojo. Oh, Skojo's like, I'll beat your ass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I haven't played with many. The Atlanta Quest staff, we've got a few golfers. I know Josh Brickey's pretty good. We were supposed to play a couple years ago. It didn't work out. Yeah, I I play in Vegas at the at the meeting with a few folks uh, here and there. Richard Kearns, who runs uh, Centennial, Burleson Centennial in Dallas, he's good. I play with him. He's good, but I'm a depressed golfer, man. I, I played a tournament at my club. It's called the member guest. So you take one member then you invite a buddy and I invite a buddy and we, uh, we made the playoff. It was the last hole. He put me three feet away. I needed to make a three foot birdie putt to move to the next hole. And I missed it. So, well, this is what you do. This is what you do. You bring Atlanta quest to the SCPA show out here in Southern California. You bring your golf clubs, and then you just stay like an extra day, and we'll go play some golf. Did dare to? We actually have a we act, we actually have a hookup out in the desert area where the big courses are. That he says he can get us on some good some of the like the PGA courses out there. Well, let's do this. Let's do this. I don't think we're gonna find forty grand in the budget anytime soon to uh, take the whole truck out to to California. But what we can do is when you guys come to the Atlanta Regional, mm-hmm. maybe if 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 we go. Well, if you go, it's yeah. going to be a big one. I think it's going to be even bigger this year. If you come, we'll play around at my club. Oh, that would be great. I would love that. Do they do they rent do they rent clubs there, and so we don't have to schlep our our whole set? I know they have one set. I can ask. They probably got. A if couple. we're going to play, I might bring my clubs. <laughs> I might suck it up and do it do it too. But we definitely have uh, we definitely have one set of rentals. We probably have a couple, but that'd be amazing. Yeah, let me know. It'll be fun. That would be awesome. I'm actually playing. Here's a plug. The Pacific Crest, yep. they're uh, they're having a golf tournament next Friday. Mm-hmm. I'm 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 hacking it up in in that tournament, and I'm looking forward to it. Everybody's warned. Yeah, yeah. That'll Watch be out. fun. Let me just say four now, and just so everybody knows. Yeah. All right, TJ. Thanks for doing this, man. This was great. This was really great. Um, we love uh, we loved getting to see you work in person uh, during the season last year. Um, we love sort of seeing you out there. We love seeing you on the aged out podcast, but this conversation, I feel like we got to know you a little bit better and that's, um, that's amazing. Thank you for being so open and willing to, uh, to talk about your, your life coming up in, uh, in this activity. I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys having me on. I think what you guys do for the activity is, uh, is incredible work. The exposure you give the kids, uh, the in-depth conversations you guys have with folks. You know, I, I watched a little bit of the Zach Schlicker one. I watched some of the Taha one here recently. It's awesome. Uh, there's, I mean, the, the the age we're in of coverage for this activity, I wish I had when I was a kid. Uh, it's going to stick with these guys forever, and you guys are pillars in that. So it's... Uh, it's why we do it. That's exactly why we do it. Because we wish we would have had it. 100%. Yeah. No, it's incredible. Neat. Thanks a lot. Real quick before we leave, do you have any uh, sponsors or endorsers you want to give a shout out to? Personally, no, I don't have any. Uh, but Atlanta Quest is proudly endorsed by Mapex Majestic Innovative Percussion. Who else we got? We got Sabian. We got Personas. We got a whole laundry list. Remo. Remo, but no, I don't have any. I think I 
curse too much maybe for them to <laughs> want me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. And with that, you know, I think that wraps it up. Yeah. I mean, you cursed just enough for this podcast. So that was perfect. It's like a little bit of a, put a little spice a little there. spice yeah 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 sorry i try i try not to but every now and then it just comes out oh it's all right we're I excited uh it. we're excited to see what quest has in store for us this year um on you know the, the one thing i will say just to wrap it up is that um again because i said it earlier what you guys are doing for your area your community um when on social media you guys are doing your sort of pre-audition camps and like and you're putting that stuff out on social media you're it's evident that you guys are really having an impact, you know, yeah. uh, and hopefully you guys reap some rewards as far as like the talent level, right. That, that, um, you have to choose from, but from what I've seen, it's always packed in terms of like kids signing up to want to, uh, uh, learn from you guys. Um, so we're excited to see what that, what, what you guys have in store this year. Yeah. So are we the whole quest Q2 family, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to it. And we need, we need an AQ, uh, audible in every single show. <laughs> like I, I love it. I just love it when, when people are like, you know, like when a, some random lines like AQ in the, in the actual, even, especially if they don't have any affiliation with you guys, it's just like, yes, we need it. We need it. We need an East coast audible. We need an AQ yeah. one in there. Yeah. It works well. It works, it works seamlessly, you know, two, two counts, real staccato. It's almost like a fun little dut. Yeah. It's, it's funny. You know, we had kids go to Crown and we had kids go to BK, like the late 2010s, 2017, 2018, and they would throw in an AQ vocal. Mandarin's had one. But I think every now and then there's like one and there's no kid in it, which is which is finally like, why are they even saying it. But I agree. It's part of the culture. If it could become ubiquitous across every group, that would be fun. Hey, that, don't, don't make me pull out my dictionary now by using those big words. But yeah, <laughs> what well, he said, that's exactly. Ubiquitous. Yeah. Ubiquitous. And with that, I just, you know. Thanks, thanks again, TJ. And we're, we're going to wrap it up right now. And real quick, go out and donate to your favorite group, whether it be indoor, outdoor, mm-hmm. you know, go donate to their scholarship funds. So that way we can help get some people to march. And we'll see you next time here on the Drum Corps Coffee Shop Podcast. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.